Hi, everybody. This is Alan Soldovsky, executive producer of the 2021 Legacy of Poetry Festival and director of creative writing here at San Jose State University. I hope everyone is continuing to stay safe and well, and you're at home viewing this wonderful Zoom edition of the annual Legacy of Poetry Festival celebration. I'll be your announcer for tonight's special tribute to Lawrence Ferlinghetti. But before we start, let me tell you how to learn more about upcoming SJSU Legacy of Poetry Festival events. To learn more about upcoming events, go to the URL that's shown on the screen and also that we've put into the chat or follow the SJSU Legacy of Poetry Festival on social media. Tomorrow evening at 5 p.m., we're offering a special masterclass and workshop in performance poetry video production with Mighty Mike McGee, World Slam Poetry Champion, and Shaka Campbell, presented by Poetry Center San Jose. Before we begin, let me first thank the sponsors who have made the San Jose State University Legacy of Poetry Festival possible. The 2021 SJSU Legacy of Poetry Festival, Closing the Distance, Sheltering in Technologies, is produced by the Poets and Writers Coalition and the Creative Writing Program at San Jose State University. We want to thank the following groups and organizations who have made these readings and special events possible. Our principal sponsor is the San Jose State Poets and Writers Coalition in association with Associated Students of San Jose State University who provided us with some of the funding that made these events doable. Additional support is provided by the English Department at San Jose State, the Diasporic People's Writing Collective, Read Magazine, the oldest literary magazine continuously published west of the Mississippi, and Poetry Center San Jose in association with Poets and Writers, Inc. Other co-sponsors of the San Jose State Legacy of Poetry Festival include City Lights Publishing, Copper Canyon Press, Noemi Press, University of Pittsburgh Press, and Poetry Flash, the literary review and calendar for the West. And a special thanks to those on the Legacy of Poetry Festival Zoom production and marketing teams who provided us invaluable support and assistance behind the scenes. Special shout out to Clifton Gold, special events producer in the University Advancement Office. Also our engineer coordinators, Juan Cerna, Keith Sanders, and Terry Graziani. And a special shout out to Michelle Frey, Senior Director of Creative Strategy at SJSU, who helped us get our visuals together for tonight's program. Thank you all for giving your time and energy to make it possible for us to celebrate National Poetry Month together and close the distance during the COVID-19 pandemic. And now let me introduce esteemed photographer and documentary filmmaker, Chris Felver, who made Ferlinghetti, a rebirth of wonder, the writer, producer, and director of the film that we're screening tonight. Chris, welcome. Please tell us a little bit more about the film and your friendship with Lawrence. Chris? Well, it's all started, uh, it actually started when I met Neely Cherkowski on Grant Avenue uh, in the late 70s. And I said I wanted to meet the poets of uh, North Beach, or I wanted to meet the beat poets. And Neely said, well, there's a reading tonight. And it was a May Day reading. And he said, everyone will be there. And everyone was there, including uh, Jerry Brown. And uh, with cameras, and uh, that was the beginning of a wonderful uh, journey, low these many years ago. <laughs> so as I got to know Lawrence from that night on, we had a, I was a photographer and I was a wannabe filmmaker. And uh, I made some, I worked down in, in, down south in Hollywood and I couldn't wait to get up here to do some of my own work. So uh, Lawrence was a perfect subject. And I was surprised that no one had, you know, made any film on him before. So we fit together just like uh, 
you're supposed to, the filmmaker and uh, the uh, subject. So uh, we carried it on for a long time. And uh, I finally finished it, I think, in uh, about 2012, actually. And there was How many one... years did it take, Chris? I don't know. <laughs> because some of, the, some of the work was from earlier times. And we, I made a film called The, the Coney Island of Lawrence Ferlinghetti, which was sort of a day in his life. And this was more from his peers' point of view, this film. So actually, there are two films. <laughs> but uh, they, you know, it started in that day, that early year, and uh, in the late 70s, and we started on. Uh, one day, he was doing uh, over at Keystone Corner. And we just filmed over there, I remember. That was great. And then I took an interest in his painting, which was done in his uh, studio at uh, 250 Francisco. He had a tarp on the floor. I thought that was very cool. And uh, so I took, took an awful lot of pictures of Lawrence, which ended up in a book, uh, Ferlinghetti Portrait. But um, this film has taken uh, a while to make, uh, but everyone is, uh, well, the reason I think we got together so well is that we went to Nicaragua together and we did a book down there, uh, Seven Days in Nicaragua Libre. And it was then I realized Lawrence was very, he's a very peripatetic person. And so am I. So we got along fine like that. And I think that just sort of kept going in that, in that manner, you know? I mean, after all, he, is, uh, he was, I was sort of learning you know, the spirit of resistance in the anarchistic way that he was teaching. It. And, uh, you know, I knew he was the smartest guy in the room all the time uh, with the rest of the poets. They were all, I was very quiet for a long time, learning and listening. So it was, uh, it was a wonderful experience being with him. And we always had a good time, always had fun. And I mean fun, you know, we, we traveled over to Ireland and uh, to a poetry festival there, Berlin, some of those or in this film. Uh, we drove from Tuscany down to Calabria, filmed some down there in a really old little town. And uh, so it's always was a great gas being with him. You know, we always had fun and uh, I mean fun in the true uh, pleasureful sense, you know. Because Lawrence was, you know, he was a master champion of wordplay. But and, Lawrence uh, knew how to live too. Oh yeah, yeah. So, but you know, it's funny, I, I was seeing this the other day that, uh, uh, you know, a farewell to arms was banned. And I thought Lawrence knew about that. And so when I'm sure when Howell got banned, he was tickled pink, you know, in a certain way. So I, I you know, I, I, I don't know, I have so many thoughts about Lawrence, it's sort of hard to pull them all together in a certain thing. But he pulled them together for me in my book. And I will read this what he said. He said, <laughs> Felver pursued me over the hills and dales of painting and poetry catching the highlights and lowlights of a lifetime fomenting art and anarchy. And that was in 1998. So we, uh, we sort of uh, were very simpatico. And I miss him like everyone does, you know, this, this yeah, whole- we all do. Our, our whole group has, uh, you know, been, uh, they've, t they've taken away a big building block. And- well, uh, We're gonna celebrate his life. We're gonna watch your film, it lasts about 80 minutes. And then we're going to come back. And we're going to have Chris again, Joyce Jenkins, Neely Cherkovsky, and we'll have Garrett Caples from City Lights Publishing and uh, Patrick Sergalski, an artist from San Jose State. So if we're all ready, Maestro, I'm talking to the men behind the scenes. Well, I think we're ready to see the show. All right, see you later. Let it go, let it go. The film is available both online and on DVD through the filmmaker's website. I hope you've all enjoyed it as much as we have seeing it again. It makes us all nostalgic for one of the greatest people in the world that we knew. Now let me introduce you to tonight's panelists who will discuss the film and their relationship, their relationships with Lawrence Ferlinghetti. Tonight's moderator is Joyce Jenkins, the editor and publisher of Poetry Flash. She's the author of Portal and Joy Road Chapbooks. Her poems have appeared in Parthenon West Review, Ambush Review, 
Addison Street Anthology, Berkeley's Poetry Walk, Ziziba, The Place That Inhabits Us, Poems of the San Francisco Watershed, and elsewhere. She's also the organizing force behind Berkeley's Watershed Environmental Poetry Festival and the Northern California Book Awards. She also received an American Book Award in 1994 and the Penn Oakland Josephine Miles Lifetime Achievement Award in 2006, among other honors. Poetry Flash received Litquake's Barbary Coast Award in 2012. Also on the panel is Garrett Caples. Garrett is a poet and an editor for City Lights Books where he curates the Spotlight series. His latest book of poems, Lovers of Today, will appear this fall from Wave Books. His earlier books include Power Ballads and Retrievals, among other titles. He is also the co-editor of Incidents of Travel in Poetry, new and selected poems by Frank Lima, published by City Lights and Particulars of Place by Richard Moore, published by Omnidon, and the collected poems of Philip Lamantia, published by the University of California. We also have joining us the poet, essayist, and Ferlinghetti biographer, Neely Tcherkovsky. Neely Tcherkovsky has written a biography of Charles Bukowski, as well as Lawrence Ferlinghetti. In addition, Neely is the author of Whitman's Wild Children, a collection of essays about 12 poets he has known, Michael McClure, Charles Bukowski, John Wieners, James Broughton, Philip Lamantia, Bob Kaufman, Allen Ginsberg, William Everson, Gregory Corso, Harold Norris, Jack Micheline, and Lawrence Ferlinghetti. Neely also produced the first San Francisco Poetry Festival and in the early 1990s helped to found Cafe Arts Month, a yearly event celebrating San Francisco's cafe culture. We also have with us on the panel visual artist Patrick Sergalski, a professor emeritus of art at San Jose State University. Patrick collaborated with Lawrence on a number of art projects including lithographs and silk screens that were produced in the print studio on the campus of San Jose State in 1992 and 1993. And we are, and finally, we are fortunate enough to have filmmaker Chris Felver back with us on the panel. Chris, whose 2009 Ferlinghetti, A Rebirth of Wonder, we just had the opportunity to watch together. Felber has also made films on, jazz music, on the jazz musician Cecil Taylor, on photographers Sam Weinstaff and Robert Maplethorpe, on Donald Judd's Marfa, Texas, and a documentary of the West Coast Bohemian culture called West Coast Beat and Beyond. He currently is finishing a film about the sport and spirituality of the game of golf. Everybody welcome. The panelists now will discuss Lawrence Ferlinghetti's life and work for about 15 minutes. And then the last 15 minutes of our Zoom time together, Joyce will read from audience members questions. So if you have any questions, please put them in the chat now. And without further ado, let me turn things over to our good friend, Joyce Jenkins. When I first met Lawrence, I was a young poet from Detroit. I had worked, out, worked on the uh, National Poetry Festival and organized the Michigan Poetry Conference. One memory sticks out, standing in line behind Lawrence in North Beach to hear a reading by Ginsburg. Lawrence waved me in and I tucked my finger into his belt loop. He towed me past the ticket takers. I remember stepping over Jerry Brown, who was sitting on the floor. I met Joe Wahlberg, manager of City Lights Books and other classic SF characters. Lawrence had an idea for an international Carnegie Hall festival stage for poets. 
We had meetings upstairs at City Lights. I carried my office in a basket and wrote a poem called The Only Woman in North Beach. I wrote one of the first grants to the newly minted California Arts Council and got $20,000 for a festival at the Palace of Fine Arts, 1978 and 1980. We had poets flying in from all over the world for the San Francisco International Poetry Festival. Rex Roth escaped from the hospital to read. After that, Lawrence was always a friend to Poetry Flash. I gave up the festival to edit and then publish the Flash as a free newspaper that grew to 22,000 circulation. Now it's online. My motto, my guiding light, was always the quote from Lawrence. If you would be a poet, write living newspapers. Don't ever believe poetry is irrelevant. In later years, Lawrence read at our Watershed Environmental Poetry Festival, reading A Buddha in the Woodpile about Waco, Texas, and talking zero population growth. When he was the first San Francisco Poet Laureate, I was on the committee. He had my late husband, Mark, and me combing Treasure Island to see if we could help him get the city, make, um, get the city to make a poet's house. We helped Chris Felber as much as we could with the film that you just saw. I presented the Fred Cody Award to Lawrence for the Bay Area Book Reviewers at Fort Mason, only one of many awards, but heartfelt and one of the very first from his community. He had delivered a speech, the publisher as enemy of the state at the 1985 awards, and I published it in Poetry Flash. I keep remembering lines from Poetry as Insurgent Art. They flash in my mind like the mottos and signs he painted and hung in the windows of city lights over the huge crowds that gathered in the streets at his 100th birthday celebration. In 1971, he persuaded Nancy Peters to leave the Library of Congress to begin their collaboration. She moved to San Francisco and began working as an editor at City Lights. In the midst of the Vietnam War and the First Amendment challenges to the press, City Lights was our beacon. Lawrence and Nancy helped City Lights avoid financial crisis by becoming co-owners in 1984. And in 99, they bought the Columbus Avenue building that had always been the bookstore's home. City Lights became a registered landmark, landmark in 2001, the first time this had been granted to a cultural institution. For me, Lawrence is a personal hero who immeasurably enriched our literary life by his poetry, his love of visual art, and his dedicated work to bring his vision into the future. I can't imagine free speech and poetry today without his life and work. Here are some random lines from Americus. Poetry is the shook foil of the imagination. It should shine out and half blind you. It is the sun streaming down in the meshes of morning. Poems are questions posing further questions. The poet mixes drinks out of wild, wild liquors and is perpetually surprised that no one staggers. Poetry is not all heroin horses and Rambo. It is also the powerless prayers of airline passengers fastening their seatbelts for the final descent. It is the real subject of great prose. Like a bowl of roses, a poem should not have to be explained. Poetry is thinking with your skin and any child who can catch a firefly owns poetry. Next, we have Chris Felver. Unmute yourself, Chris. I've been watching a lot of television lately for the last year. And I, I yield my time to Neely Cherkowski. I want him to talk about Neely. Neely's my man. We did everything together and we're still together. And, I, and Joyce, without Neely and Joyce, I, I yield my time to Mr. Cherkowski. 
Neely, go ahead and unmute. <laughs> unmute it, Neely. <laughs> unmute it. Oh, no. oh my. Keep, ta keep talking, Chris. Uh, well, listen, Mr. Tchaikovsky got me into this. And boy, did we have a good time. And then I went to see Joyce. And at that point, <laughs> I had a place for my pictures. And then Neely, the ambassador of North Beach, hat shop, by the way, with Jack Mueller, we decided to do the film uh, of, you know, sort of monitoring the, uh, the North Beach scene. And uh, we did that. And it was on KQED and everything. We had Jack Mueller was involved and Kay McDonough and obviously uh, Bob Kaufman and, and, and uh, uh, the, whole, the whole beautiful, beautiful situation in the late 70s, early 80s in San Francisco. Like Harold Norris said, there were more poets than there were uh, people. Should I continue now? I mean, is Neely, Neely. how's Neely doing? <laughs> well, you send Neely a message. And should I call him on the phone or what? what? <laughs> He's been muted, but, that yeah. guy, but nobody can talk about about Ferlinghetti like Neely. His father took pictures of Ferlinghetti. I mean, Neely's like the king hold of all these people. No, Neely, you can hold the space bar down and you can unmute. Um, <laughs> well, <laughs> well, I don't. Well, then, Mr. Could we have Mr. Mr. Caples? Is it wrote this most beautiful essay on Mr. McClure's passing. And I want to, you know, so I want to say that. So let's, I, I yield my time to Mr. Caples because Mr. Tchaikovsky can't <laughs> press the space bar. Uh, Garrett, go ahead. Uh, okay. Um, well, I, uh, I met Lawrence through initially the poet uh, Philip Lamantia, who I was a fr friend with. Uh, it's also how I met Chris, actually, back in the day. And um, uh, after Philip died, uh, his widow was Nancy Peters, who you saw in the film. And she uh, she's a co-owner and uh, was the director of City Lights. And she brought me into the organization uh, after I'd helped, or helped her uh, sell Philip's papers to the Bancroft Library. And so that's how I met Lawrence. And, uh, um, you know, Lawrence, the interesting thing to me about this film uh, is that Lawrence actually in person was actually was usually very shy and reserved, you know, but, there, you know, Chris, Chris's film was great for uh, getting Lawrence sort of uh, loose and... Uh, and uh, you know <laughs> the things that that he did because he was a really shy and reserved guy. He had been an orphan. He'd been in orphanages, so he, uh, um, you know, it left its mark on him. Uh, but uh, you know, when I first started working there, I was just doing office work and reading submissions. Then uh, I had to stop coming in for a couple of months because I was working on some writing projects. I came back in. I bumped into Lawrence, and I hadn't, uh, he asked why I hadn't been there. So I told him what, what I was doing, and he, he just said, uh, come back, which was really sweet of him. It was the first time I'd realized that he had uh, yeah. registered with, that I had registered with him at all. Neely's coming back. Good, good. And so, uh, so I did, and uh, we had a manuscript of F Phillips from his papers called Tau, and Nancy let me uh, put that together for, for City Lights as a uh, book, and uh, Lawrence, we went out to lunch with Lawrence once, and, and he said, uh, "Why don't you make it a pocket poets book?" So, which was a pretty, pretty amazing uh, thing for him to offer. Uh, so, and that was the first book I edited for City Lights, and I've gone on to be an editor there, uh, sort of fairly quickly. Um, partly just from being a poet, and it's useful for a place like City Lights to have a poet on the editorial staff. Um, but also Lawrence, you know, Lawrence was very shy, but for some reason he was comfortable around me. And so I started becoming his, uh, personal assistant on and off, like, uh, would do, you know, errands, uh, come over and mess with the computer, that sort of thing. Uh, but, you know, I just, I tried, tried not to bug him too much. And so we had a good, good, uh, relationship. But what I did bug him about was once I started doing a lot of poetry for City Lights, 
um, I would consult him about different things, especially Fre French translations in particular. You know, like he, he wanted to read, if I was even thinking about something, he wanted to look at that. And, uh, you know, I remember a Michel book came in that we eventually did publish by, uh, translated by Julian Conley. And, uh, you know, Lawrence and I, we, you know, I can't, I came from sort of a background with Philip uh, and surrealism and stuff. And so, you know, we, saw, we often disagreed about poetry or he thought some of my opinions were ridiculous, but at the same time, he was very cool to me and he didn't think I was ridiculous, which I really appreciated. He treated me like a poet who knew what he was talking about, even if he didn't always uh, uh, agree with what I thought. Um, you know, and he was very nice. He, I laid a book on him, my second book when it came out, he, and he definitely read it because there's not a ton of feedback, but very specific, like, you know, very pinpointed uh, feedback about things. And he came to a reading even that I gave at City Lights. So it was very, uh, it was very nice of him to do. He let me launch a new, new poetry series at the, at the store called City Lights Spotlight. And if, if Lawrence hadn't been cool with that, it just never would have happened. And uh, yeah, I mean, I, I got to work with him once on a book because uh, he found David Meltzer's uh, When I Was a Poet. We were at a party and David read it, and and Lawrence was like, uh, you know, go ask him if he's got a publisher for that. Yeah. <laughs> and so I, and he didn't. And so uh, you know, it was kind of it was probably the last book Lawrence acquired for City Lights. And uh, you know, David and I really put it together, but we kept Lawrence into the in the loop, and he uh, he even rejected one poem that we wanted in there. So he had his he made his mark there. And the other thing I got to do with him was interview him for the Paris Review. When he went in the run up to him becoming a hundred uh, years old, a couple of years back, um, you know, he couldn't really see at that point, and he didn't really want a stranger to be coming by the house because you have to do like three interviews plus a follow up interview for a Paris Review thing. And uh, but you know, he, for whatever reason, he liked me enough to let me uh, come over and do it. And you know, we did it and we finished it and he signed off on it. And then he, at the end, he's like, oh, it's a pretty good gig for you, isn't it? <laughs> like, yes, it is, to write for the Paris Review and to interview him. And so it was a really nice gift from somebody who's actually given me uh, a lot in my life. There we go. Beautiful. Okay. I think I can hear now. There we go, Nelly. You can hear you. I'm ready. Uh, uh, yes. Oh, thank you so much, everybody. This is very incredible. Chris, thank you for your lovely film. It's been a while since I've seen it. Thank you for the uh, kudos. Um, you know, I've done so much on Lawrence since his passing. I remember the day he passed, I had a, the inevitable phone call from somebody. Usually it's Jack Hirschman, you know. Hello, Neely, this is Jack. Guess who died? <laughs> <laughs> he didn't do that this time. I guess somebody else called and you know, I cried for about two seconds and then I told myself what a beautiful life i mean yeah oh so he wasn't perfect i mean he and i had our problems for years you know to have a bookstore to be a poet to be a painter to be a publisher to be a public figure and he's one of the few persons i know who has been in history he was inserted into history we heard it in the film he was at he was on the a landing craft at Normandy. He was at Nagasaki 45 day, days after the Delio. Uh, he spearheaded the whole thing with Howell. Uh, I think I don't know if it's said in the film, Chris. It was the juvenile department of the um, of the SF police who came and arrested Shigmarao, the manager of blessed memory. Uh, but I want to say, you know, so I've spoken so much on Lawrence. I haven't really said. 1962, I'm in the City Lights basement and I have my little magazine I did called the Black Cat Review. That's how I met Bukowski because he sent me poems and I published a poem. I published the first poem that Ray Bradbury ever published. And he wrote me and he said, just don't come and visit me. I'm glad to send you the poem. <laughs> uh, <laughs> at any rate, <clears throat> Lawrence, I saw Lawrence and I knew him from the cover of uh, Holy Island of Mine, which was really an initiatory bridge 
for me. I'd been reading a lot of Cummings. That was enough to screw me up. But but uh, <laughs> that in Goya's greatest scenes, that did it for me. That just did it for me, that first poem on Goya. And then 40 years later, the Goya room at the Prado. Wow. And I thought of Lawrence. I heard, even heard his voice because I do my Ferlinghetti. I did it at one of his birthdays. Do it. Do it. Do it, Neely. I do it. it. I, oh, well, okay. Hello, Neely. This is Lawrence. <laughs> you want to meet me at the Cafe Trieste? It's a beautiful existential afternoon. You know, that's sort of Lawrence. Well, so he comes up, to, so he's in the bookstore in 62, and I published his magazine, The Black Cat Review, and immediately he said, oh, is it published in red ink? And we laughed, and he went, and without my asking, he grabbed a copy of a, of a Coney Island of the Mind, and he signed it. And I, you know, I got to tell you, that there's another book I have, I told Joyce that, uh, he gave me a copy of, of, of a book a couple of years ago, one of his last publications, and he put a drawing in it and he said some very nice things to me. And I don't know where that is, and I don't know where this other book, it might be at the Bancroft, you know, because I, 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 I gave him a lot of books, I just didn't have a huge correspondence, so I put a lot of my books in. Oh, anyway, I anyway, so Lawrence, so, so two years ago, I'm in New Orleans, and I get a call from Agneta Falk, the poet and wife of Jack Hirschman. She said, Lawrence wants to speak to you. And I called him up. Well, he hadn't called me in 30 years. He used to call me to go to the movies, by the way. We'd go in this battered old Volkswagen bus he had. And you know, Lawrence is a great anarchist. He's a great man. But when he's behind the wheel of a car, watch out. I found out why it was battered. You know, We used to go to the uh, Times Theater way out in the avenues. And then he started inviting me to Big Sur, to Big Speak Canyon. And I went with him there a few times. And he said, you can use the outhouse. It's the same one that Kerouac and Ginsburg used. <laughs> and he had me write my name there. It says Jean-Louis Kerouac, Alan Ginsburg, Neely Tchaikovsky, Lawrence Ferlinghetti, and who else, you know? And, and so I spent a lot of time there with him and on my own and with Lorenzo and Lawrence and, uh, I almost saying to myself, when he died, I said, thank you, Lawrence, for the keys to the cabin. I can't tell you how wonderful uh, that has been. But at any rate, that initial meeting was so incredible because that book, I, I pick it up, Coney Island of the Mind, all the time, you know, and um, it's, it's, it, it's just amazing. And I think that uh, I wrote Garrett earlier, I think I wrote it earlier, and I said, I don't remember the title of the poem, but the, I think the finest poem he ever wrote, he wrote in his 90s. I think he was 95. And well, that's at sea, right? Yeah, at sea. Yeah. And yeah. that is a, such a magnificent poem. It's everything Lawrence wants, wanted about the sea. I mean, Lawrence told me one day, we were out on the bay sprinkling Bob Kaufman's ashes rest in peace. And, and I threw him in and Lawrence did. And Lawrence looked at me, he said, someday I'm going to retire and live out on the bay in a little boat. And I said, no, Lawrence, poets don't retire. <laughs> not allowed to retire. And I said, poets don't get old. They grow ancient. So he turned out to be, that's what he turned out to be. But anyway, so I'm, I'm backing up a little. So this call in New Orleans was amazing and I don't need to share everything because it, it was very beautiful for me. It was like a, a blessing from the father. I was, I was very lucky in my life because I feel like I was blessed by Charles Bukowski, the big tough guy when I showed up with my partner who happens to be another man and Hank took me aside and he said, listen, I'm so glad you're with somebody. I hope you're spending the night. And, and that, that just solved all that right there, you know. And um, with Lawrence, it was just, um, well, the day that we did, Garrett, the day that we did the celebration at City Lights, it was his birthday. He called me then too and he said, 
I just wanted to say that everybody said you stayed all day for the whole thing. And so I said, well, I had to, Lawrence. I was the last speaker. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, I mentioned, so I mentioned Lawrence, and I do want to mention something about Michael McClure, because in the end, for me, I wrote this book, Whitman's Wild Children. I've got another book coming out of 10 more poets. It's Clark Coolidge, Bernadette Mayer, Ann Waldman, Jack Mueller, um, uh, um, several other people, Wanda Coleman, Amiri, uh, uh, Jack Hirschman, and um, we don't have a title yet, but it's going to come out with the other book at the same time. Um, but now, what was my train of damn thought uh, that I was saying? So, oh, I see them as almost like one person. It's 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 ridiculous. I know. Maybe it's a maybe it's a Buddhist thing or something, but but like. I'm I'm amazed that the the if you haven't seen the last five poems, or six poems of Michael McClure, he's writing these great poems and he talks about a bent license plate <laughs> in one of the poems, and uh, he had such great love for Lawrence and Gary Snyder. It didn't surprise me, but. Uh, a few months ago, you know, in, in relationship to Lawrence is dying. He was so spot on about Lawrence, you know. It seems like almost everybody is. It seems like everybody loved Ferlinghetti and he left a part of himself in all of us, right? You know, and, and, and I think about what, uh, it's funny because, this is really going far afield. I, I'm, I'm a great Nietzsche fan and Nietzsche's, one of Nietzsche's big projects was the end of revenge, the idea of revenge. Well, Lawrence had his darker side and all that, but Lawrence practiced, what, what is the anti of revenge? What is the word? He practiced that, let me tell you, you know? And, and in terms of fame, he really handled it in a real Emily Dickinson kind of manner, Whitman figure that he is. He really did because, you know, look, look how he kept that store, the size that it is. So about two years ago, I'm standing across from a city license, Japanese man was taking photographs and he had a book bag and, and I said, you're taking photos of city lights? He said, yes. He said, where else in the world do you find a bookstore that's a shrine? Well, right. I thank you. Up. Thank you, Neely, for yeah. all that. Okay. Thank you. We're, we're going to, um, it was just wonderful. We're yeah. moving on to Patrick Sergalski, who uh, also spent some time down in Bixby. Uh, oh, and Patrick's that. got some uh, slides of some art that Lawrence and he worked on together oh, to great. talk about. Yeah. Okay. Uh, first of all, beautiful film, Chris. I've never seen that before. Um, I met Ferlinghetti in 1992. He was invited to San Jose as part of a, the major author series sponsored by the Center for Literary Arts. As part of that event, um, the center was producing a, a book plate that was to be inserted in Lawrence's book, When I Look at Pictures. And then Lawrence would sign the book plate and the, that was mm -hmm. then given to uh, various donors. Uh, that book plate also carried an image of my own. Uh, connected with the same event, uh, with Lawrence's participation, I produced the broadside as a fundraiser for the center. Uh, I chose his poem, Upon Reflection, since it referred to Big Sur, which was a, a place I was uh, fond of, and made a color lithograph to accompany the poem. Mm -hmm. And that's really where uh, my friendship with Lawrence began. He liked the result of that broadside and, and expressed an interest in the lithographic process. Um, I, at the time, was unaware of his visual art uh, work. And so I invited him to come to my class uh, at San Jose and do a, do a print. It was my habit to occasionally invite artists from the outside the university to come in and work with the more um, advanced students in the production of a print. Yeah, yeah. Uh, could we change the next? Can we go next, please? Okay, he, he, this is a, a, a photo of, of him working at the time. Um, it's in the, the uh, Litho studio at San Jose. 
And, and the, the woman with Lawrence uh, was a, 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 an artist named Stephanie Peak, who at the time was also sharing a studio at, at Hunter's Point with them. To go to the next slide. Um, okay, and uh, so the, the first thing that he produced was this image uh, of Freud, kind of a double uh, image, one of these sort of Wittgenstein ex uh, perception experiments. So you see the, um, you know, the, the woman's body, which then also defines Freud's face. Um, interesting aside to this, when um, Lawrence did the first version of this, uh, he had written Freud as one would write it, you know, on a piece of paper. Um, and I always assume people in there realize that uh, printmaking is a direct transfer process. So when we pulled the first proof of it, what we had was this this portrait of Freud, but underneath it said Durf. And uh, so we, we then uh, erased Durf, uh, had Lawrence uh, write Freud backwards, and then he included uh, a, a text running along the, the side of the the, the image, if we could go to the next slide. Um, the, the print on the left was the, the finished work. Uh, Life was a real dream. And, and he, uh, of course, had reversed Freud. So we, Freud no longer was Durf. Um, the print on the right was another litho that uh, Lawrence did. It was kind of a mixed media piece, um, monotype and litho. Um, and upon seeing it, Lawrence expressed to me that he felt that the image was maybe a little too cliche. So um, we, we set that one aside and, and never uh, went on with it. Um, can we go to the next slide? Yes. Okay, so um, it's interesting. I, I was thinking about Robert Bly, who used to like to say that men relate most easily when they're shoulder to shoulder, you know, talking about you know, men in, engaged in some sort of work. Um, and during the course of working on Lawrence's prints, we had occasion to have quite lengthy conversations because it, it, there's a time factor involved in litho and you're um, a lot of times waiting. And so we're, we're chatting and um, uh, actually something that Garrett said, uh, touched on my experience with Lawrence. You know, I was at the time, I think mid to late thirties and Lawrence was already into his seventies. And it was a really a, 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 an act of generosity if not tolerance that he would even be interested in anything I had to say. Um, mm -hmm. But our conversation eventually turned to um, Paris. And uh, I had recently returned from time spent in the Saint Germain de Pre area, which Lawrence had been uh, many years earlier. And not long after that conversation, I received in the mail um, a, a selection of poems that related to um, that part of Paris. And Lawrence suggesting that perhaps we could do a collaboration of uh, pairing these prints or, or these poems rather with, with prints of mine. Um, and uh, more on top of it, he suggested that I, I, I use as a studio the, the cabin in Big Sur, which mm. we've already heard mentioned. Uh, and it was also very generous uh, of him to do that. He, you know, he said it's very quiet there in private. You can, you can focus. What he didn't say, um, you could go to the next slide, was that at least at the time I was there, which was about 92 still, um, there's, there was no road to the cabin. I'm bringing with me about 15 litho stones. Uh, there's no power to the cabin, so there's no light, um, and there's no water <laughs> to the cabin. Uh, the, the, the premise of litho is water and grease are mutually repellent, and you need water. It's one of the things. Anyway, so it was, um, I don't know if it was part of Lawrence's sense of humor that I learned about in greater depth later, or he just uh, you know did, didn't occur to him that, that these were things that I needed. Anyway, it worked out. I, I ended up working outside of the cabin, and it was a wonderful place to, to do that. Um, I too saw the outhouse where uh, Kerouac slept here, and and all the rest. Uh, could we go to the next slide? Oh, and who gets to see this view of the Big Spicanyon Bridge? If you can even get near it now, um, I'm glad I took that picture. 
Okay, next slide. So, I'm um, sorry about that focus. Uh, these are some of the, it was, there were 13 images. The work collectively was called Paris Transformations and they, they were poems that had been previously published um, in, a, in one of his books. Um, but we did a, it was a small, um, you know, I think an edition of 20. And uh, so I'm, I'm gonna run through a, just a, a few of the, not all 13. Um, so, you know, I was working from sketchbooks that I had made in my, during my stay, looking at Lawrence's poems and making selections that I would then develop as a, as a lithograph, you know, based on, on, on my work, but also uh, bouncing off of his work. Go to the next, next slide. Okay. Um, and then, you know, uh, for example, this print, in the poem where it's mentioned uh, a train. And I, I, this came from a sketch of, you know, riding in a train, looking out the window. Um, they, um, my work tends to be um, more abstract. And I remember talking to uh, another poet who I've worked with in the past, John Yao, um, when I was beginning this. And, you know, I was telling him, you know, these, these poems are so full of imagery. Um, and I, I was really, um, uncertain how to, you know, how I was going to go about, you know, doing them so that they would have, you know, some connection to the, the my experiences, uh, and yet somehow or other connect to Lawrence's poetry. And um, one thing I've learned working with poets, and I love, love hanging out with poets actually more, I think, than, than fellow artists, uh, is the way we work is is so, in some ways, very different uh, a painter creates a statement that is taken in all at once. You look at the image, you see it. I mean, you may spend more or less time with the image, but essentially it's there, you perceive it instantly. With the poem, they, they, they tend to unravel a little more slowly. And I, I, I kind of like that, uh, you know, pairing of the two ways of seeing. Go to the next, next slide. Um, okay, and some things are, were very, you know, uh, I think, I think very directly connected to uh, to the poems. I remember, you know, in this particular one, um, a reference to um, uh, organ music, um, Dupre's organ music, to be specific. Um, uh, there was something about uh, the the area around the Louvre, and, and I had maybe the only time in my life ever brought a sketchbook into a museum and did a did a drawing and. This particular one actually came from a, a Rembrandt painting called Philosophy and Meditation. And it, to me, it seemed to work well with, with this image. Next, um, and uh, this one was a, a literally uh, yeah. a, a drawing of the, the, the doors in the apartment I was living in, in uh, when I was in Paris during my stay. Uh, uh, French, French doors are mentioned in the poem, seemed like a good match. Um, this one, I, I was, we're, Lawrence and I were looking at it together, and his first reaction was it reminded him of a jail cell, and he went on to tell me about his brother, who evidently was a, uh, a prison warden, and, yep. you know, when, and then at the end of the story, he, he, he said, well, let's just leave it, because it's, you know, that was your, your vision. Another one uh, that's, that's quite literal of talking about the sidewalks uh, of Paris. And, and if you walk those sidewalks, they're full of cracks and attempts to fill the cracks. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and sometimes they're very graceful. And then the, you know, the, the, the colophon page um, you know, saying, which is always kind of like the who, what, when, and where of, of any of those kind of uh, collaborative works. Okay, here, um, after that uh, project, uh, Lawrence, and I were having a conversation one time. I'd taken him around San Jose and I took him to City Canvas, which is a kind of a utilitarian uh, canvas place where you get awnings made or drop cloths. And uh, he liked these large painters drop cloths and he bought several to use as a painting support. And he had mentioned to me his desire to somehow or other include a photographic image of the Statue of Liberty in the work. So I I showed him how to make, or I told him initially how to make a silk screen. I told him what was required, you know, in, you know, 
you mentioned that, you know, well, Warhol had done this, of course, and if one wanted to, you could screen print oil paint into the canvas and then work it up as a, um, a, another painting. So we made this screen. It was about, the image was about four feet by, I don't know, two and a half, three feet. And I remember the first day I took, we, I went up to the studio in Hunter's Point and showed Lawrence how to modify the paint so you could get it through a screen. And there was this, I'm sure you've all seen this smile that he gets on his face when he, he, he sees the possibilities. I fully thought the next time I was in San Francisco, I'd see that screen printed on the Transamerica building and, and every other public space. But he, instead he, he, he used it as a vehicle to these satirical and, and to my mind, you know, humorous paintings. There was another one I don't have a slide of of the Statue of Liberty riding in the back of a pickup truck. That was quite, quite good. Um, so, you know, after this work, um, I, I, well, several, several years after this, I was going to Italy to work with an Italian poet on a, on a project. And Lawrence was, you know, as always super generous with his contacts. He, you know, he set me up with uh, people in City Lights Italia. I don't even know if they're still there, but, um, and, and finding a translator, um, just you know, tremendously generous that way. And he mentioned um, that you know he had these other poems. That I think they were as yet unpublished, called Palimpsest at the time. This was still in the '90s, and uh, we never got around to doing it. It's one of those regrets, you know. Um, my dear friend Niels Peterson um, wrote a poem in which the poet, after, when he's passed is ushered into a library and shown the works that he never pr never produced. And some poets will take the book down and look at it. Other ones don't, they go somewhere else. And I always felt that way. You know, I think about the Palemsis uh, pieces. I wish I would have done them. And I will yield my time. <laughs> nice. Very good. Wow, what an amazing set of people and remembrances. Um, Lawrence Ferlinghetti's life can't be summed up in a film or in a brief panel discussion. There are going to be more books written about him. Neely's going to give more speeches. Um, Garrett's going to edit more Great City Lights books. Patrick's going to be inspired to do more art. And Joyce and I are going to just keep writing poems that try to live up to the example and live the kind of life that Lawrence Ferlinghetti would have hope that we could or will, and that we will pass the messages on to the future. He set a standard, didn't he, Joyce, for all yes. of us? Yes. Just a few last words before we go. Let me uh, thank everyone on the panel and uh, um, get to my script here. You've been watching a tribute to Lawrence Ferlinghetti a special event presented as part of the 2021 San Jose State University Legacy of Poetry Festival, Closing the Distance, Sheltering in Technologies. The festival is presented by the Poets and Writers Coalition of SJSU in association with Associated Students and the San Jose State University Department of English and Comparative Literature and by Poetry Center San Jose. Tonight's reading was also made possible by support from the Diasporic People's Writers Collective. The week of San Jose State Legacy of Poetry Festival events are also made possible with the support of Reed Magazine, the oldest continuously published college literary magazine west of the Mississippi, Poetry Center San Jose, and Poetry Flash, a literary review and calendar for the West, edited by Joyce Jenkins. Please join us again tomorrow, Wednesday, April 21st at 5 p.m. for a special master class and workshop in performance poetry and video production with Mighty Mike McGee and Shaka Campbell presented by Poetry Center San Jose. You can still register for tomorrow's master class by clicking on the link you see on the screen and that we're also dropping into the chat right now. To learn more about San Jose State's Legacy of Poetry Festival and our events, click on the URL that we're showing you next, go.sjsu.edu.
edu backslash legacy of poetry 2021 and which we've also dropped into the chat this is alan soldovsky wishing everyone a good evening mm -hmm.